Hi, everybody, and welcome to Mesa Talks. My name is Carlin Stewart. Sorry about the technical difficulties. You know, a year after doing this, we still have to get better at it. So always, always working for uh, you guys, always working hard. So I am coming at you from Los Cicetos Historic Site, and uh, you are catching the second of our Mesa Talks um, of this season. We will have more. Um, and today, you know, this, this uh, is in partnership with Mesa Prieta, and um, from Mesa Prieta, we have Chester here to give the talk. So uh, Chester will go ahead and take it away from here, and he'll introduce um, himself and his background, and then he'll get started. So take it away, Chester. Yeah, this is, uh, there we go. Now you can hear me. Um, sorry, folks, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. We did a rehearsal earlier. These did not show up, but uh, glitches do happen. And like Carly said, we are working to improve this. So I want to, before diving in, give a quick shout out, of course, to Carly and to Ethan and everyone at Los Luceros State Historic Park. This is our second year of doing the Mesa Talks lecture series in collaboration with each other, and we look forward to continuing this collaboration next year. Some of the slides that you're going to see in my presentation are going to probably be familiar for anyone who tunes into my Chat with the Archaeologist webcast. This webcast airs on the second Friday of every month at 2 p.m., presented, of course, by the uh, Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. And in addition to being able to catch the uh, monthly news about archaeology and what's trending in archaeology, you'll also get the monthly updates on what's going on with the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, which I know a lot of you are always dying to hear about what's new, how are things moving forward, especially in a chaotic year like 2021. So check me out over there and I'll save the rest of those announcements for that. Now, I'm going to begin with a rather long roundabout way of getting to the point here, so please bear with me. I know I don't have the fortune of having a captive audience in the way that I would if these talks were hosted in person, but yeah, please stay tuned. I will get to both sensation in archaeology and how we can combine quantitative and humanist ways of doing archaeology and communicating about it. But first, I would like to start with a story. Ask any astronomer what they think of anthropology and the social sciences, and they're likely to give you a response somewhat along the lines of, well, social sciences are really soft sciences, if they're sciences at all. Likewise, ask a botanist or an ecologist what they think about the uh, practice of archaeology, and they might take interest in how archaeological sites relate to landscape features and how those sites and features relate to resources. However, if you were to ask them about if you were to ask them about iconography, they might take a look at petroglyphs and say, well, you know, the sheep kind of looks like a sheep, but I don't feel comfortable diving in any more than that, which has been an unfortunate loss for the iconographic analysis of rock art, especially in Western North America. People who identify with their profession in the hard sciences tend to be hesitant to take risks when addressing things like symbolism and symbolic behavior. Now, in order to appease these STEM fields, the astronomer, the botanist, the ecologist, we archaeologists pile together data. We engage in systematic weights and measures, some of us to the point that we engage in a practice that we call archaeometry, which is really a focus on the methods of measuring and weighing and quantifying 
archaeological evidence. So to appease these hard scientists, imagine the grad student with a box full of printouts of data. Um, yeah, it could be on the thumb drive now. But imagine them with this box full of, of data. Print it out because this has been going on since, since the day before USB thumb drives. And they trounce from Science Hill, where all the STEM departments are, over to, we'll call it the Humanities Quad. And this is where you find the departments of history and philosophy, art history, linguistics. And they're like, look, look at all this, look at all this data I have. And they're like, great, but where's the people? And this is a question that we as archaeologists have been asking ourselves and of our colleagues for decades. In fact, it comes up time and again. There was a famous archaeologist, I believe it was Gordon Willey, and if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments, who said, archaeology is, anthropology is a social science, or is it, it is nothing. And that's because in the Americanist school, archaeology really did emerge out of what is today cultural anthropology. Likewise, in the European school of archaeology, Archaeology emerged out of the disciplines of history, and art history, and classics. And so, from the very beginning, we've been born from and engaged with the humanities. But we've also been engaged with the material sciences, with, with the hard sciences, the earth sciences. Some of the first archaeological methods are borrowed from geology, methods that we still practice today. Many of you are familiar with the idea of stratigraphy which is that usually the newer deposits are on top, and as you dig deeper, you get further back in time. This is a borrowed method from the hard sciences by our discipline, which came out of the humanities. And so it's odd that many archeologists, myself included, will find ourselves experiencing a bit of tension, where we feel like we're straddling two worlds. There's a divergent fault in between. Are we scientists, or are we in the humanities? And the fact of the matter, matter is that archaeology is essentially an interdisciplinary study from the moment it started. Again, we came out of, yes, history and classics, but also out of anthropology, and also borrowing from geology and, and the other materials sciences. This is not something that only happened in archaeology's inception, but has been an ongoing process that continues to this day. So how do we reconcile these? How do we put together that box full of data and still be able to tell a story, a story about people? Because as many anthropologists and scholars of the humanities will argue that if we try to talk about the past, without people in it, then we are essentially dehumanizing those who lived it. Thankfully, there's a way to reconcile this. And that is possibly one of the greatest endeavors of uh, archaeology, one of archaeology's ultimate goals since it emerged as a discipline which is to investigate the experiences that people had in the past, to attempt to answer the question of what was it like to be there and live it, to be in that time, in that period, in that place, in a cultural context very different from what the scholar might experience in their everyday lives. And this is the phenomenological approach to archaeology. So, what is phenomenology? I'll go back. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, the study of sensory experiences and cognition. In brief, that is what phenomenology is. And we've got some great quotes from Ruth Van Dyke here about phenomenology that will also help us transition into our next slide as well. 
And it's from this phenomenological approach that the idea of sensory archaeology really comes into play. And that is one of the ways in which we can bridge the gap, because we still borrow from all those scientific methods. Everything we do and say, we want to be able to substantiate. In the sciences, we call it reproducibility. In archaeology, you know, we, we might say reproducibility, or we might just hope that our peer reviewers don't sh shut us down. But really, we can take these methods and we can be bold with them. We can take those scientific studies and apply them to things like iconography. We can apply them to other aspects of human experience and expression. And that's what this presentation is really all about. And so, yeah, Ruth Van Dyke actually gives us a, a great transition into our, uh, into our idea of landscapes. And this idea that uh, oddly shaped mountains, peaks, buttes, and volcanic plugs featured prominently in Pueblo traditions. And this is not uh, exclusively the domain of Pueblo traditions. This is also a great way to bring in that ecologist because we already have the landscape from which to work. But how do we take maps and data and distributions of resources, elevation on terrain, and turn that into something that people experience? That is one way to understand that landscapes have form, shape, and color. They have prominent features that help people orient in the world and which seem to animate <laughs> or to be animate in their way of coming out of the terrain. Such is the case for this example called Zoo Cave, featured by Mark Allen in 2011, as he expounded upon understudied theoretical approaches to Mojave Desert archaeology. If you just take a step back and look at this rock formation, look at the play of light and shadow, then you'll notice that the void can also be experienced as a dark stretch, as a serpent slithering across the rock face. This motion is emphasized, or this perception of motion is emphasized by the shape, by the shadows, and by the movement of the shadows. And it is believed that this formation held such significance as it's associated with archaeological materials from the indigenous peoples of the area. It's believed that it was remembered as a serpent, and in particular in this area, the serpent is connected with the color black, something we'll touch on again in a moment. And so here, ironically, in a black and white photo, we've got an example of the use of color in understanding the landscapes and understanding how people experience the landscapes. This is another example, not quite the Mojave Desert. This is from Tomokani State Park. I did get permission to share this. And here we have a rock formation where both color and form are important. This rock formation and a rock shelter right underneath it is sometimes known to the indigenous Kwayasu as Coyote and Puma's house. After all, the creature on the left of your screen, or the rock formation on the left of your screen, looks like a mountain lion, while the one just a bit below and to the right looks very much like a coyote. You can even discern the shape of the haunches catching the light, the tail tucked underneath, the forelimbs somewhat outstretched, and even the ears swept back. These are remarkable rock formations, and from this angle, bear a striking resemblance to the animals for which they're named. Heck, you can even see the mountain lion's shoulder as it crouches. And so here we have unmodified landscape, presumably, that still holds deep cultural significance. And the color of the rock formation here emphasizes the colors of the coats of coyotes and mountain lions. 
or cougars if you want to continue the alliteration. These photos are from one of my trips to, uh, to Latin America, specifically on the left. Uh, actually, I believe both of these are in Belize. Um, to, the, to the left is the cave Actun Tunicho Mugnol, which for a while was closed to the public. I got in before that happened, but I hear that they've reopened at least a part of it again. And then to the right, is a site that is colloquially called El Castillo because of the weathered ruins resemblance to a castle with ramparts. However, this is much a process, uh, much a result of the processes of degradation. In fact, archaeological sites are not stagnant in the here and now, but they are always transforming, reshaping, evolving. This is what we call taphonomic processes, which is the impacts of weathering and wildlife of roots and burrowing animals on the archaeological evidence, on the artifacts, on the structures, the constructions like you see here, and the overall landscape. Humans also play a role in taphonomic processes, something that I'll get to a little bit later in this presentation. But suffice it to say, a part of the experience of an archaeological site is not just as it was in the past, but how it is today, how visitors might experience it today, and how we can communicate about it to give a representation that is intelligible to our audiences. Of course, being careful about the cultural implications to the sorts of verbiage that we use. Sometimes, the colloquial nicknames of archaeological sites might be understood to be insensitive to indigenous peoples. So even while this site, it's okay to call it El Castillo, don't go and nickname every archaeological site. It might actually irritate the descendant communities. But I want to talk about the picture on the left because we also have some of that light play, that darkness, that void. So snakes, whether you're in the Mojave, in the southwest, in uh, northwest and central Mexico, or here, all the way down on the Yucatan, they're associated with portals to the underworld. And here we have a doorway, a natural shaping doorway that has that sort of S shape, those curves of the snake form. This was seen as an entrance to the Maya underworld, Shibalba. And so when you enter into this cave, you are entering into the underworld. That same experience happens again at one of my study sites. If you've seen some of my conference presentations, you may have seen a slide similar to this. On the left, you have a map, both plan view on the top and then profile view on the side showing the orientation and changes in elevation of a particular petroglyphs and pictograph site in the Mojave Desert. And this underworld is expressed in what in this image shows up as the lower gallery. To enter the lower gallery, you go about a third of the way into the canyon and there is a low, dark void with some interesting iconography and a wall of dark black dolomite. And then you go behind the wall and make a near 180 turn. That's probably closer to 140, 150 degree turn. It's a sharp turn around the back as if you have gone into the underworld. And here, the partially metamorphosed sedimentary stones, limestone, marbled limestone, dolomite, have taken on an interesting patina that makes them very dark and black. And a part of this is because of the aggregation of lichen in this spot, because the gallery is so narrow and tall that direct sunlight seldom hits it. So the lichen is able to thrive where it would have otherwise been baked off and 
helped patinate the surfaces deep, dark black, like the underworld. And as you start to ascend out of this, going in the map of left to right, you're going through a door with snake imagery around it, like Mesoamerican representations of the entrances to Shibalba, whether they are naturally formed or whether they are carved. You pass these snake and the snake imagery and move into a room with the most red pictographs in the site. As you can see from the red dots, there aren't very many of them. But here's the most, and we'll feature this one in a moment. Red was associated with valley floors in this region. In fact, on the right of the screen, you have a colored tier system to a worldview and a cosmology of the structure of the world as seen by the indigenous peoples of what we call the Numic homeland or Numic heartland. And this in particular is derived from ethnographic work with the Pahrump Valley Paiute, who described the experience of going from the valley floors up to Mount Charleston in the Spring Mountains outside of Las Vegas. And these are the colors that you experience. The valley valleys get their color red probably from Death Valley itself, where a lot of ochre is in fact to be found. You know where to look, but I ain't telling. As you move from the valley floors up into the foothills, you get this blue-green turquoise that's a sort of conflation of all of these colors into one name that we see so prevalently across the Americas. And this color is associated with the foothills because that's where you find pinyon juniper forest. You have moved up towards the sky, not all the way, towards it, some blue, and you're surrounded by greens, blues, and blue-greens, where the vegetation is able to thrive as much as it can in the desert. Um, in fact, there's quite a lot of biodiversity in the PJ forest of the Spring Mountains because it's not quite so sun-baked there anymore. And then as you pass above the tree line, you start to get these exposed outcrops of sandstone and of quartzite and the rocks just scream yellow. And on the top, the snow caps persisting late into the year, the clouds that can blend in with them visually if you're looking from below. These are the colors associated with the sky. And the petroglyph site on the left is a microcosm from the lower gallery up. So the upper two thirds of this site. You are moving through this five tiered color-coded system. Now you might be familiar with the colors of the medicine wheel and the way that different Native American groups assign different, uh, assign the same colors to different directions is very culturally dependent. Working with the same suite of colors here, we see that the Timbisha Shoshone and the Pahrump Valley Paiute, instead of associating those with directions, have mapped out their world based on a multi-tiered cosmos. After all, when the mountain ranges are trending north-south, you can align yourself with a range or with a valley. You can always orient north-south and then you've got your east-west, right? You can see the arc of the sun. This is easy. But knowing where you are in these tiers in the Great Basin, which is shaped like a giant washboard with up to two vertical miles between the valley floors and the peaks of that washboard shape. It's important to know where you are in the tier system because that tells you about what's there. And so this place is very special in that it recreates the microcosm, going through all five tiers from the lower gallery up to the top because that also tells us that it's what we call an axis mundi, a portal between the worlds from the underworld, through the worlds of the living, or in some cultures, this might be referred to as Middle Earth, but to the Namit Shoshone and Paiute of this area, that's, Middle Earth is actually three worlds, the red, the turquoise, and the yellow worlds. 
and finally culminating in the celestial realm, in the peaks and the clouds and the sky. And that is the tie-in to Polynesian archaeology. Polynesian, Melanesian, Micronesian, peoples of the West Pacific, of Oceania, of the South China Sea, because that's one of the tie-ins to navigation. And in fact, up until about the 17th century, maritime navigation all over the world relied almost never on instruments and almost entirely on one's own perceptions. And people were able to actually get around pretty accurately. These methods have been reconstructed, are the subject of revitalization projects, and forgive me, I don't have a link in my references section, but uh, I'll also share that, you know where to find me on, on social media now. Um, there was a, a wonderful session about um, some of these ongoing efforts to um, preserve and teach these navigation techniques to the next generation. That uh, the session was just held in the SAAs. And it's very inspiring because this is something that is both archeological research, but can be embodied today. In this image is the famous boat, Hukulea. It is a va'a or vaka, uh, va'a in Hawaiian, but vaka in virtually any other Polynesian language, which is an ocean crossing canoe. We say canoe, and it might conjure up the image of something that you float down a river. But as you can see here, this canoe is huge. Um, it's double masted and it is rigged up in a very traditional way, except for the, uh, the orange round fender there on the, on the tarpaulin. But otherwise, this is rigged up like the ocean crossing canoes of uh, of the past, of the first Polynesians to reach Hawaii, and those who continued sailing in between islands. Their sort of wayfinding, of course, relies heavily on the senses, the experiences of astronomy, both the knowledge that they hold and positioning themselves, their bodies, the canoe, and the crew of the canoe in relationship to these stars as they move across the sky. But this isn't the only way of applying archaeoastronomy. As we know, it can be used for timekeeping, as many folks are familiar with here in the Pueblo Southwest. And archaeoastronomy is not the only way of navigating. Wayfinding is an experience that engages all the senses. Sounds over a calm water can actually sometimes uh, get caught in between the calm water and, and a, a thermal inversion layer that makes the sound travel much farther. Likewise, when not engaging with the stars, you can tell from cloud formations where at least tall islands are, and from the swells of, uh, from the direction and periods of the swells, both where land is, where storms are. In fact, the swells are an embodied experience, something we'll get back to later. But before I get too far away from archaeoastronomy, I couldn't help but share this example. Again, from this axis mundi, as you move through the world, uh, through the multi-tiered cosmos, these are astronomical observations, the flowery path indicating that the linear bands are in fact depictions of the Milky Way. Notice the parallel bands with a gap in between because of the dark dusky lane in the middle of the Milky Way. And this orients perfectly with a depiction of a constellation of three leaping sheep called mountain sheep in the sky. While this is a common constellation in Western North America, really it's only in this corner of the Mojave Desert among the Timbisha, the Pahrump Paiute, the Mojave people, and the Chemohuevi where the mountain sheep in the sky in the constellation that we call Orion is in fact three leaping sheep. So this ties this place to the indigenous peoples of the area. We see actually a very accurate rendering of the orientation of 
the stars in the alignments of the mountain sheep and the position in relationship to the bands in the Milky Way. But spaces like this can be experienced in other ways. After all, if you're in a canyon, the sky might be partially or nearly wholly blocked out. But like the sailors listening on the calm, still water for sounds in the distance of animals, of lapping waves that could tell them where they are, so too visitors of petroglyph sites listen. In fact, these stones here are significant. And if you see the mineral staining, the colors of the mineral staining are important, like that chromaticism that we saw at Zoo Cave a few slides ago. But also as important are the sounds which echo off, which seem to come from behind the stone. And this gets us back to that sort of personhood of places. There's a concept called uh, genii loci, and I am often want to mispronounce that simply out of habit. But genii loci are place spirits, or literally the genius of the spot. Um, they are inhabitants of particular landforms, of particular places. So whether the place is conceived of as having uh, a genius locus, or whether it's conceived of as having its own personhood, as being alive in its own right, sometimes that's not the right question to even ask. Because either way, this sense of non-human personhood of place is indicated by things like these waveforms, <laughs> these sound reflections. And here's a visualization of resonant tones in one of these spaces at the Axis Mundi. But this is sensory archaeology, and I want to engage more than just your sense of sound, or your sense of sight. I also want to engage your sense of sound. And to do that, Got a little video. shelter. There is a deep shadow cast here. Back here there's fire standing against the wall where a fire would have been lit. You can imagine the aroma of the fire and of the tea being brewed. Natural plants, a couple of them here, we have strong evidence were used to make teas, possibly um, mind-altering teas as a part of a religious experience that would have been hosted by this place. Any sound made is going to come back strongest in those tones. So imagine the flickering light of the fire, the smell of the smell of the fire, perhaps a hint of a tea brewing, and then hearing these sounds come from all around, not just the back of this little shelter, but the whole cave, uh, the, the whole chamber that we just panned through. And a part of these experiences, these religious processes, involved sound, song specifically. And so the people here doing these things would likely be engaged in song, ways of remembering things like the constellations that we saw illustrated. This is the same room. That was just a panorama. 
And so with those tones that I just played, every song you sing, every word you say, every step you take is going to come back stronger in those tones to the point that it sounds like something is speaking to you from beyond the rock surface in just about any direction. And, of course, song is emphasized by instruments. The distinction between the instrument and the body can actually be a little vague. After all, as Emily Brown, Ruth Van Dyke, and others have recognized, often the human body was the most powerful musical instrument, especially in Western Native American traditions. Likewise, musical instruments like these from Honduras, again, fans of, my um, of the Mesa Freda Petroglyph Project channel and of the Chat with the Archaeologist webcast may recognize these. These were recovered, um, I recovered these from a site in central Honduras. These were ceramic whistles, ocarinas, figurines, but these ones particularly have the evidence of airflow. In fact, we even have a mouthpiece illustrated here. These were just in my notes. These weren't supposed to be the, uh, the official illustrations, but it gives you some idea of this combination of musical instrument and of body. So when these instruments were played, the sounds that they made would be seen as the voices. And this was common also, um, another one that I uh, neglected to include in my references list, this one of the Yuge Flute by uh, Sarah Barber, Art Joyce, I believe uh, there's at least one other name on that paper, and that's from Oaxaca. But their argument, again, is that the voice of the flute is the voice of, in this case, of the ancestors. So when we see figures, whistles, and ocarines, ocarinas that look like people, it might be their voice. When it looks like an animal, it might be seen at, or understood, heard as the call of that animal. Even those that are made of the animal, but not necessarily depicting it something that we call an indexical relationship rather than I an iconic one. But of course, the human body, as I said, is an instrument and is also the place for instruments. Turtles might be a confusing thing to show you when I'm talking about musical instruments, but keep in mind that tortoise shells, traditionally, and to this day, have been used as rats and they are a part of ceremonial attire by many Native American groups, especially Pueblos. And this is a feature that you can see if you go to the uh, Gathering of the Nations or to any of the local powwows or feast days. Um, it, this is an ongoing tradition because the turtle carapace is actually a great rattle. So to our mugs, but since so few of them have been specially made into rattles, as Emily Brown notes, that there may be mugs that simply were not expressly made to be rattles, but could have been used in that way. And so this wearing of instruments, rattles, things that we call tinklers, or in the uh, Great Basin, we might call them charm stones, and just little slate tablets strung up uh, on the body. Again, something that we still see today, as well as bells, which we know were traded up from Mesoamerica into the Southwest. Um, these help the person to embody the performance that they are engaging in, producing sound with, uh, with their bodies, with the motions of their bodies. So bodily performance is an important part of sensation, whether that's from quotidian tasks, flaking chipped stone, uh, making stone tools. When flaking that stone, engaging in an auditory act, as well as a haptic act, you can feel the vibrations go up your arm with each strike on the stone, much as you would if you were making this petroglyph, pecking at it with a piece of quartz or possibly a piece of granite. It's important to note that quartz is in granite. 
esports is important, it's hard. And so if you're pecking this pretty hard basalt with even harder quartz, then you're also getting that haptic feedback, that vibration of the arm. These considerations are part of a broader picture of what Leroy Garon called the chain operatoire, um, the chain of operations. And that's how we do any task, whether it's you know, in archeological contexts, from making pottery to <laughs> flaking stone tools, to making a petroglyph, to our, <laughs> the things that we do today, whether it's our job or our hobby. If we are engaging in a repeated task, uh, often that will uh, we'll do it time and again in much the same way. And often that is informed by the communities or communities of practice to which we belong. So we can tell a story about person, uh, about individuals, group identity through the chan operatoire, how the thing is made. And then we can turn that back around to make reasonable deductions about what it was like to experience doing that, whether individually or as a group. As a part of a broader thing that has been labeled ritual behavior, but when we say ritual in archeology, span the um, adept archeological scholar will say pattern behavior. Ritual is often conflated with religious, and while many religious practices are ritual, not all, uh, not all rituals are religious. But religious, uh, religious performances, public performances, religious rites are all an important part of bodily practice. And the body is also important in expressing gender, which we'll get back to. But think for, uh, think about when you're doing this repeated action, something that you've learned from someone else or that you've followed from someone else such as moving up this canyon here. These are footholds. You might be familiar with Chaco and Rhodes, carved into absurd landscapes. Similarly, this site in the Mojave Desert has multiple places where there are a series of footholds, almost not quite reminiscent of Chaco and Rhodes. Of course, these aren't going to Chaco. They're going through the Axis Mundi. In fact, if I can take a 3D slice, which I can, I did a 3D model of the spot, take a slice right through it, you can see why these holds are necessary, climbing at a steep angle up a slick surface. And so we can see it from the top and below, and another example to the lower right. Positioning the body time and again in a position where someone else has done that before. Here, this is on an overhang. This is a petroglyph on the underside of an overhang, of a very tall overhang. Um, at least two and a half, three, well, no, sorry. Um, at least five meters, um, perhaps more. Sorry, I was doubling down on my math there. Um, yeah, this is high. Um, and so for the person to climb up there and do the, I, I overlooked this first several times I passed it because I didn't expect to see anything up there. And then there it is, you can see the enhanced version. This is a cradle board, a Shoshone style cradle board. So again, we have an expression of Shoshone, particularly Timbusha Shoshone identity at this location. And that is in a position where a person would find themselves upside down. So we ask, how do they experience that? Because that is a very, out of the ordinary way of experiencing the position of one's own body, the sense that we call proprioception. Of course, we engage in proprioception uh, navigating. If we flash back to the Polynesian sailors navigating by the swells, that is something that is felt with the body. You don't even always need to look at the incoming waves to feel the roll and the periodicity and the magnitude of these swells. You start to feel these swells coming from different directions with different timing and get an understanding of if you're getting close to land, 
one of the directions that souls were coming from might have just gone silent. You might be able to feel yourself sort of dragged in, almost. Um, this is an embodied sense, and it, it is the sense of proprioception. Here we have an example of someone engaging in out of the ordinary proprioception. So are they experiencing this in the way that they are using it to orient or reorient themselves in the world, like the sailor experiencing the swells, or are they experiencing it in the sense of bodily transformation, of going from human to other than human, possibly a spider? Maybe not necessarily Clark Kent, but at least Peter Parker. The sense of bodily transformation was important to certain religious practices. And we see it depicted in the iconography, such as this enhanced image of a what we call a patterned body anthropomorph from that site, holding what appears to be a net, possibly some other implements too. And <laughs> there's a lot to unpack in that iconography, so I'm not going to uh, dive in, but some of the depictions of people that we have there and here at Mesocrieta show figures with human characteristics, such as some of our humpbacked animal flute players, also animal characteristics, so that humpbacked flute player might have a tail. We've got several of them with tails. They're in a state in between the human body and the animal body, and a process of transformation. So we must wonder if the person hanging under that overhang, making that petroglyph of the cradle board, was experiencing a moment of transformation. Likewise, one's gender is both expressed through embodiment, but is also a factor in how one perceives one's own body and how one's body is perceived by one's community. This example on the right is one of the more famous fragments of a Kiva mural. And it's depicted in a lot of sources. The one that I show uh, that I, I chose to show here is Jolie 2014. But you should also look into Kelly Hayes Gilpin's commentary on this mural. This is a woman. Um, we understand this figure to be a woman wearing a dress and holding a bird, a macaw, which is a type of parrot that was brought up here from Latin America from central Mexico and from, as we understand now from isotopic analysis, from Oaxaca. So we talked about the Yuge flute all the way down in Oaxaca. What does that have to do with the Southwest? Well, we had live animals <laughs> coming from Oaxaca up into the Southwest, up here in New Mexico. And we know that the Pueblos around here kept scarlet macaws well, fairly late. In fact, the Spanish prohibition on the use of bird feathers, especially macaw feathers, was one of the reasons that members, uh, that, that Tewa speaking members of uh, the communities of Okeawinge and Santa Clara, um, especially Okeawinge, uh, cited for uh, organizing the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. <laughs> Those parrots are special. And it turns out that keeping parrots was a gendered activity. After all, it was men who would keep turkeys, but women would keep parrots, which has a lot of interesting implications. And rather than going down that rabbit hole here, I'm going to refer you to my SAA pre or ARARA, American Rock Art Research Association presentation coming up on June 12th. Parrots are a part of a complex of religious iconography that we call the flower world complex. This idea was first proposed by Jane Hill in 1992, and this article blends linguistics, there's your humanities, with archaeology, there's, there's your social sciences, um, with the, uh, the oral traditions, with the songs of indigenous peoples all the way from central Mexico up through California, Nevada, Utah, what we call the udo aztecan language family. Here are the criteria. I'm not gonna go too much into depth here, but parrots are associated with the flower world, and so are rainbows, 
some more flowers, such as this, this false color image of a, a floral bloom. That's one of those pictographs that I uh, mentioned at the Axis Mundi earlier. And then if you can believe it or not, the uh, upper right image is actually a sculpture of a macaw head recovered in Honduras, and, uh, excuse me, Honduras. And uh, it's not very clear in this photo. Uh, again, it was 2008. You know, digital cameras weren't as good uh, or available uh, as they are now. So I was using a lower resolution camera back in the day. Uh, and it makes it a little difficult to see the eyes. Um, but it had even eyes um, engraved in it. I'm not trying to trash talk that camera. Oh, I, uh, I, I really appreciated that camera. And that was a macaw head. And the image below it. This is starkly enhanced, just so you can see it. We've got, uh, and this is from right around here, an image of a macaw flying over what's probably a cornstalk. And so we have this association of macaws with very important symbolism to the Tewa Pueblos here. And that's where we get into my next couple of examples. First, now this one comes from, <laughs> excuse me there for a sec. This one is a rather simple rendering, but it is believed to be a parrot or macaw. Is that a uh, rather well-known site that a uh, Seth Bowles recently spoke publicly about, and it's not the only one there. In fact, if you're to uh, pan up from this location and take a look back on this hillside, I'm not giving too much location information away. <laughs> Still a very generic hillside, but if you go back in that direction, you'll arrive at the example that I just showed you in the lower right the previous slide. Likewise, these hillsides, these boulder fields, like we just looked up, can be hosts to these macaw images. Just give you a sense of the towering height and scale of these boulders. Here's a much more elaborate macaw image. Uh, this one actually has some patterns indicated in the feathers, which probably is also a reference to uh, chromaticism, that symbolic significance assigned to color. Additionally, we've got uh, a knife wing motif here, which is another type of bird image associated both with the Southwest and with Mesoamerica, but outside of the talk about the macaws because I showed you the macaw and then the image next to it was of a figure with an apparent rainbow over their heads. Well, macaws are associated with rainbows in the Pueblo world. And so it should be no surprise then that these imply the colors of rainbows. After all, that's what their feathers show. And they situate where we are. This is the Pueblo world. Looking out over onto the Bosque, we have, a, as you can see, the slopes of Mesa Prieta are bare. And this location, just barely above the uh, tops of the canopy of the Bosque, still fairly low on the slope, is already up above the fertile plains that hosted both the agricultural fields and the uh, residences, the, the Pueblos themselves. And yet we're seeing the macaw images up here, even though they're depicted presumably down there with corn stalks and other such images. I'm just gonna pan down this panel for just a moment. Notice all that stippling. This stone has depictions of macaws. It's also, as it turns out, a ringing rock, and that probably explains 
all this stippling, all these bright peck marks that are so sparsely scattered all over it. So just about, um, just about center here, we've got a very clear macaw image. And then next to that, there's an abstract form that mimics its shape. This too is in fact an iconographic macaw. It invokes the way that the, caw is, the macaw is depicted, not necessarily in petroglyphs, but certainly the way that it's depicted on pottery in this region, in the Four Corners, and even not too far off from examples from further south in New Mexico. One of the telltale signs is the hooked beak at the top that gives it that sort of B shape. And we are cued in to this as a macaw because it's right next to the clearer depiction of the macaw right next to it, the more naturalistic depiction. In a similar way, that Axis Mundi site has various depictions of quail, both the quail top knot as a decoration on individuals, the naturalistic depiction of the quail bird, and abstract compositions which invoke the form of the naturalistic depictions of the quail bird. What we're seeing here is that macaw is an actual macaw, but it's also a lot of things associated with the macaw and the places where those associations are depicted. The macaws weren't raised here on the mesa. They were brought from Mesoamerica, raised and even bred in the Pueblos probably the Pueblos at the foot of the Mesa, and then either the macaw itself or its feathers would be brought to these spots where we see these depictions as a part of very musical public performances, not unlike the use of colorful feathers in feast days, traditional dances, powwows, and similar expressions of Native American culture that continue to thrive today. Now, this animation here, if we can put that macaw in a nice context in relation to the bosque, but to make it better, if we can go around it, if we can zoom in, we can really see the iconography really clearly here. So we've got the macaw just left of center, and we've got the iconographic abstractly depicted macaw to the right of center. The beak shape is very telling, and you'll notice, in fact, that if we look at the head, we've got a hooked beak on top and a very short lower jaw on the beak, reminiscent of the macaw sculpture from a Lenca village in Honduras. So we see the telltale shot uh, shape of the macaw and how it cues us in to these visual expressions that might otherwise seem a little bit shaky. Thankfully, here, the Tewa have given us plenty of clues. But of course, there's more going on here, too. So we can zoom out, we can pan around. We're just going to pause here for a second because we're starting to get to an upright orientation now. And so you can see that that panel actually faces nearly straight up. And the boulder it's on is casting a shadow on the boulder underneath it. You might recognize this. Of course. <laughs> I mean, the logo's in the, uh, the upper left of the screen. This macaw, or pair of macaws, is playing with the flute player. We see a musical feature, a ringing rock, next to the um, very, um, very iconic, in several senses, animal flute player of this stone. You may even know the significance of that shadow is that it was likely an equinox marker. In fact, given that the animal flute player may also be a constellation tying back into archaeoastronomy here. And this astronomical observation of timekeeping for the equinox 
macaws too are associated with spring but also with summer and there's different different aspects of the life cycle of the macaw associated with spring versus summer but we have this tie-in between the iconography of the, the the visual experience of the petroglyphs on the top and on the bottom and also this tie-in in the auditory acoustical and musical experience of both the iconography the flute player and the physical object the ringing rock that is clearly engaged with this flute player in helping mark time yet there's even more going on here so we see this relationship here what's happening here there's a faint figure a little difficult to make make out but think to those macaws that I was just showing you on the ring rock that casts the shadow the smaller stone echo <laughs> those forms that too is a macaw so we have a hidden macaw next to our macaws engaged with the flute player so the macaw associated with a religious complex we call the flower world complex okay that was just my screen glitching it, it wasn't okay <laughs> uh, you guys didn't see it but you might recognize this slide if you've been watching the chat with the archaeologist series uh, the flower world a very colorful world so the macaws help bring color to the flower world and as we see in that previous example they also help bring music and music along with poetry poem song song poems are the expression par excellence in the Udo Aztecan world from the Utes the Shoshone the Tohono O'odham to the Yaqui to the Mexica the Aztecs in a variety of languages heck even non Udo Aztecans Maya and um, many of the Pueblos are generally thought not to speak Udo Aztecan languages there's there's some debate over that um, and the point being is that this is a broad spanning religious phenomenon in which colors flowers fire and feathers are all seen as metaphors m metaphors for each other and so you might reference feathers flowers as a source of color but this is also done through largely in song and in poetry and we <laughs> so that is why it is significant to have a ringing rock that has iconography even if rendered in a monochrome format implies color but yes the flower world lives on you've probably participated in Dia de los Muertos this is a tradition inspired by the flower world as well as the Catholic All Saints Day so from bodies to full aroma and there's only uh, so many pictures that I can fit in here so I'm just going to talk to you about the archaeology of beer. I mean, first we should talk about tanneries, right? We should talk about smell. After all, <laughs> flowers have a wonderful fragrance. And so too does incense. So when we find evidence of incensarios, incense burners, at archaeological sites, we can understand those to be evidence of an experience, an olfactory experience flowers may or may not be they may be referencing aroma or color it's an ambiguity but unlike flowers and incense although there's the corpse flower that's not so um, we also sometimes study less pleasant olfactory experiences like tanneries archaeological evidence of tanneries when reported even if the study is not focusing expressly on the senses seldom if ever neglects to mention wow 
That sight might have, might have had quite a smell. You know, it must have. From smell to taste, and that's where I want to get him with the archaeology of beer. Because archaeologists have been able to extract enough DNA from the residues of beers on ancient vessels to be able to revitalize that strain. And given the material evidence, the hard sciences approach to the analysis of the pottery that tells us about the residues, sequences the DNA from the yeast, tells us the chemical constituents of the beer, which gives us the recipe of the beer, and then go and make the beer. And they taste it. And it tastes different from the beer that you probably bought at the liquor store. Um, but it's an, an authentic recipe. And in fact, there's a number of YouTube channels I, you know, so many I didn't even bother to link them. But just, just look for ancient recipes. There's a number of channels that reproduce not just beer, but, you know, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages, Roman use of wine and vinegar, what was called at the time sour wine. Uh, then there was an interesting one, Roman Gatorade, which is the use of vinegar along with some herbs that, you know, might not be the most palatable thing, but when cut with water and when you're thirsty and dehydrated and low on electrolytes, probably would have really hit the spot for the Roman soldier. And the hosts of these channels go through and do it. And they show you how to do it too. So I encourage you to look into this. The archaeology of food and beer and wine. All wonderful things. And of course, this is the most abrupt transition in this. Um, I was going to say something about going from the tannery to, or, or the brewery to the source of the water for that. But that's kind of a stretch here because we don't really have, you know, barley was introduced to the New World. And these are all examples from the, um, <laughs> from South America. So... Uh, from the, the Andes Mountains, in fact. So, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the connection is a little bit rough there, but uh, the sensations of, you know, of water and how it's brought to a place, whether it's used to tan hides, to, to brew a beverage. Of course, barley's in, you know, introduced. It wasn't in the Andes at, at, at this time, although later on, corn arrives, and, and we start to get drinks from that, but this is more about the water delivery. Because the water is a sensory experience. What we have is what, what's called an Inca stone, and that's in the upper right corner. This is shaped, uh, it's also sometimes called an echo stone because it echoes some part of the landscape in what it looks like and what it does. Here, it's invoking the Inca irrigation system by applying the principles to the design of fountains, canals, channels, to direct water when it rains on this rock. And this is something that can be reproduced by visitors to this day, if you're lucky enough to be let through that fence in the background. Unfortunately, many of these sites have been exposed to vandalism, as Carolyn Dean, who uh, published these Inca examples on the right, um, has uh, bemoaned that people will try to take some of these places with them to take some of the, the, the power. So it destroys both the place, and of course, it doesn't give you any supernatural power. Don't loot. I don't care if it's a chip, don't loot. Um, but this stone is mimicking the principles that are on a larger scale rendered in these very fine masonry works, like the one that Dean shows down below. And that would be a, an Inca fountain. And so much like the Asakia system that we have here, which as fans of Chat with the Archaeologist will recognize, is a hybrid of Pueblo Canal systems and Spanish adoptions of Moorish practices around Moorish irrigation. So we owe the Pueblos, the Spanish, and the Moors for the system that we have today. This is probably the WPA, but that's, that's a rabbit hole, right? Similarly, Inca delivered water to many places throughout their um, briefly lived empire through um, invoking both cosmological and aesthetic principles, which practiced on the stone and shown here, even where it disappears, 
and then reappears in a new spring. And we see that this spring actually splits the water and very briefly has parallel waterfalls. There's only two depicted here. Some of them have more. The numbers are significant, but then they flow into the same channel and then recombine. This practice has been going on in the Andes for a very long time. And one of the earliest examples, perhaps the earliest example, and the place par excellence is Chavin de Wantar. Miriam Kohler has been working in Chavin de Wantar for a long time. Uh, you'll see uh, Abel et al. 2008. Miriam Kohler is one of the et al's. She does the acoustic studies here. And that's the diagram that we see up here, a 3D model with people placed in there for scale and position, and indications of the interaudibility of sounds from the plaza from within, and of sound blinds, how different chambers can be in separate sound sheds. You know, they, they are not, you can't hear one from the other, but water is also directed through Chavin de Wantar. And it's believed that water was directed in there, to flow in there, both you know, for to get water in there, sure, to do some drainage control, sure, but these passageways are incredibly dark, nearly cave darkness. In fact, they're also designed to play with light in very specific ways, and so we must revert to auditory experience as the primary way of engaging with these water features in here, to even know where the water is coming from. And this can be observed today. As Carolyn Dean emphasizes in observations of Inca water features, one was still running right there, of the echo stones. The archaeologist, too, is an observer. Here's an example of a 3D model of a landscape I made at the head of a canyon where there's an archaeological site. Further down the canyon, there's petroglyphs. You haven't seen this example in this presentation before, but it's also a special place. What you're seeing in the sort of rotated indigo, light indigo, what do you call that color, um, rectangles are essentially views that I had as I walked around this space to take photographs. Those photographs were used to produce this 3D model. And so here is an interesting way to illustrate the archaeologist's own experience of the place. In fact, you can even get a sense of how high these photos are above the ground and imagine yourself in this space, standing with eye level right about at the level of those boxes. This is only one of the ways in which archaeologists can represent the experience of space. We're you know, representing our own experiences, after all. And one of those experiences is sound. After all, the ancient sound waves have long since dispersed. It's one of the briefest events in archaeological time. Archaeological time is a funny thing that should talk all into its own. And uh, we're not going down that rabbit hole. So in order for us to understand acoustics in the past, whether it's of place or of instruments, we must experimentally reproduce it and then analyze what we did, like the spectrogram I showed you earlier with resonant tones highlighted in the ovals. Here's another example. But there's a little bit of creativity to this process too, because I thought that, um, you know, I was working with, uh, some false color enhancements. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the program D-Stretch to bring out some of the petroglyphs that were very difficult to very difficult to see. And you can see in, in the background that that's what I got from D-Stretch. And then I went ahead and started to play with my uh, visual representation of the acoustics in this space in order to uh, better um, better match the color palette. After all, like, you know, I, I saw the common yellow in here, right? And so we got a little bit of yellow coming out of the blues. So then I did the boxes and the, and, and a, a kind of bluish, almost indigo color. And then, and then 
took in a zoomed in part on a particular element made from a series of superimpositions to illustrate how this bighorn sheep is coming out of these, ab these older abstract designs and color shifted it to start to match the color scheme that I was getting out of the audio software. And after a little bit of playing together, I mean, playing with these together, I came up with this very colorful representation of the experience of space, of the visual characteristics, as well as the acoustical, the auditory experiences. Now, and I'm going to monitor my sound levels to make sure that this works. Uh, if it doesn't, it might take a, a try or two. But I want to play some acoustical experiences, not from this place that you're seeing on the screen, but from, from Mesa Prieta, from a couple of spaces. Now, these aren't actually recordings from the experiment. These are artificially generated tones, like you heard earlier from the Access Monday site. And then I've added qualities of echoes in particular spaces at Mesa Prieta to give you some sense of what this sound would sound like in that spot, or what the sound source would sound like. We'll give it a, we'll give it a try here. First, the original. Let's do that one more time. All right, next. For those of you who have done two or three, there is a particular stop after the second time that you pass the initials JVJ, where there's an enclosed space. And in this enclosed space, or a semi-enclosed space, a sort of chamber unto its own, you get pretty good echoes. And so this is the first approximation of what it could sound like in that space, but this first one is going to be a little bit generic. All right, all well and good, but that doesn't quite closely enough capture the way that echoes that reverberation sounds in that space. So I did another pass through to give it a little bit more of the character of that space. All right. Yeah, can start to hear some reverb in there. Now, that's a relatively small space though. So we get, just, just imagine your sense of space from sound alone. Now to compare that, this is a long trail eight. Let's do that again. We're going to go back to trail three. And now, trail eight. So when we do reopen for tours, and we will reopen for tours before too long, take note of sound and how sound gives you a sense of the space that you're in. You notice the qualitative differences, one of those is done to give you a sense of a deeper, larger space. And that, that is something that we can take quantitative methods, that to go in and do these acoustical experiments and come up with numbers and charts and illustrations and diagrams like you're seeing on the screen here, and then I can use those to generate sounds, whether it's the reverb characteristic like you just heard, or whether it's the resonant tones like you heard in the earlier video. And so that's about all I've got for um, the topic of sensory archaeology on its own. 
we're going to uh, go into Q&A here uh, very, very quickly. It looks like I'm running you know, perfectly on time. But uh, I, I gotta, I gotta pull you up. And so while I'm, while I'm pulling up some questions, uh, here's my references section. There, there's one more references slide. Oh dear. Again, check these out. Uh, Ruth Van Dyke has recently written on this topic, especially in the Pueblo Southwest. Um, and it's worthwhile doing a, a little bit of, um, of a flashback to Christopher Tilly as well. Um, so many folks who I couldn't include here. All right, so I'm gonna put myself back on screen. I'm back and uh, Carly, do we have any questions coming in? Let's see here. Yeah, I can I can hear you okay. That's a great question. Well, um, let me go back to the figurine slide and there we go. Give me one. Um, they might not be able to. Uh, here we go. I can I can switch it over so they can hear you. Okay, could you could you uh, try saying that again? Yes. Okay. So we have um, a question from Deborah, which is, "What are the correct name for these? Are they tuned like flutes with actual music scales?" All right. Yeah. Um, so we tend to distinguish between flutes, whistles, and ocarinas um, by the the number of stops that they have. Um, so a, a flute will be a single chamber, usually a long cylindrical chamber with, um, with multiple stops, multiple holes that you can plug to change the, the tone versus an, an ocarina might be one or more, uh, usually rounder chambers that are connected to each other, which changes the, uh, more the, uh, the timber of the sound and then whistles tend to have either zero or one stops. Um, so a whistle can have up to two different tones, maybe more if, you, um, if you're good with the embouchure of your lips, you might be able to shift that uh, up and down an octave or two. So that's the terminology. Uh, often in Mesoamerica, we'll say figurines, whistles, and ocarinas because, or woes, as just one category because often when we're finding fragmentary evidence it's hard to tell which it is and which it you know and to rule out the other ones uh, especially since uh, some of these were mold made pieces so they, they made a mold out of ceramic and then put the clay into the mold to uh, to get some of these facial impressions and then you know when, once that that set they could peel it out and then and then attach it onto the ocarina or figurine or whistle that they're making and they'd use the same molds for figurines without any musical features as well as whistles and ocarinas here in the southwest um, we have we largely have um, three different types of flutes and uh, Emily Brown actually gave um, a she gave a Mesa talk or what would become Mesa talks back in 2019 that addressed this here in the southwest so we've got flutes, multiple stops. Uh, we've got whistles, which are, they look like flutes, 
uh, usually long and cylindrical, made out of reed or bone, but with, with a, a single hole. And those ones would, um, well, and, and uh, so then uh, among the flutes, I should say, so we've got uh, wood and reed flutes, and wooden and reed flutes are end-blown flutes. Uh, so you kind of blow across it like you would blow across a, uh, like you would blow across a bottle to make sound. And I'm, I'm not very good at this. I can, I can blow across a bottle okay, but honestly with uh, traditional Pueblo flutes, I've got just a little too much of an overbite, so it's hard to get it to, to set just right to do this. Uh, so I'm better at playing um, at plains flutes, which have, uh, they have an extra piece attached to it that essentially acts like, uh, we all played recorders, right, at one point, uh, usually, usually around fifth grade music class. And um, so it operates kind of in that way. As you can see in this ocarina piece that, that's illustrated here, this is a, a ceramic object that's made to do, do it that way. So like a plains, a plains flute kind of um, works a little bit more like um, a little bit more like a recorder where a Pueblo flute is more like um, it, it's like a Western flute where you have to blow over an opening, but that opening doesn't necessarily have the wedge. Now this rule is broken for flutes made out of bone. And th this is uh, Emily Brown's research um, where she reported that many of the bone flutes, uh, especially, I think all of the bone flutes in the Southwest had a piece of wax in there that kind of made this wedge shape again, like the ocarina mouthpiece, like your recorder. Uh, and so it's not even it's not even the same object because it, it, even if we call it a flute and even if in every other way it looks like the wooden and reed flutes, it's actually technologically distinct from the wooden and reed end blown flutes that are traditional among the Pueblos. The question came up about are they tuned? So two answers to that. I'm gonna again talk about Mesoamerica and then, and then talk about the Southwest. In Mesoamerica, there have been a, a couple of studies um, uh, David Rogoff um, did some either some of his graduate work or uh, a side project while he was in graduate school on I think I think his I think his uh, dissertation was on settlement patterns, but he did another project at the same time that was uh, to try to ascertain whether there was a standardized set of tones that would be used. Um, and this was based on um, ocarinas like the, the fragments you see illustrated here. And what he came up with was, was essentially a scatter plot. He couldn't find really uh, any tight clusters of tones that showed the emergence of a tonal system. So I had always been under the impression that that was generally true for the Americas, except Emily Brown points out that um, based on the number of stops and the proportion of uh, stops, distance between stops and number of stops on flutes in the Southwest, that there probably was at least an emergent standardization of tones um, rather than just random tones. So um, rather, rather than just making tones that are unique to the instrument, there does seem to have been either an established or an emerging uh, set of tones, a scale, if you will, for specifically flutes from the Pueblo Southwest. All right. Um, so yeah, good question. Uh, um, Curly, do you have uh, any more questions for me? Awesome. Um, so thank you for answering that question. Uh, we have a lot of good comments but that is the last question that people had um, on our two pages. Ah, I must have done a, a good job explaining then. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's see here. Uh, thank you, Carly, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. I appreciate, um, I appreciate all the positive feedback. I, I, I appreciate you all just watching. Um, this has been uh, very fun to present and 
I got to show you a little bit of old, a little bit of new, um, some stuff that some of you may recognize as borrowed, and um, I guess some stuff that's blue. Um, and by blue, I mean there were a, a bunch of new animations and uh, new sounds, new ways of representing uh, archaeological data that uh, I'm getting to share with you for the first time in this. So uh, this has been a pleasure. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, of course, be sure to check out our social media for, for updates. Uh, I noticed Los Luceros is very active on social media, so check them out as well. Um, both Mesa Prieta and Los Luceros are active on Facebook. Um, Mesa Prieta also has a YouTube channel, so this video uh, will, within the next couple of days, end up on the YouTube channel as well. And, um, it, yeah, uh, of course, don't forget to visit our partners at Los Luceros. Uh, they've got a, a very uh, expansive lawn uh, that's great for uh, social distancing, uh, which is which is still important. We're not we're not quite out of the woods yet, so uh, enjoy enjoy the, uh, the the open lawns and the, the wonderful weather. And um, thank you again to Carly and our, our co-hosts Los Luceros, and to the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project for supporting me in. Uh, doing all sorts of um, outreach like this talk, um, as well as uh, the research. And uh, thank you to all of our uh, supporters as well. And uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be it for me. Um, everyone have a good evening and um, tune in next month. Oh, Carly, who do we have coming in uh, for the Mesa Talk next month? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, stay tuned. It'll be it'll be on our social media, of course. Uh, Los Luceros, um, New Mexico State Parks, Mesa Prieta. We're all going to be um, we're all going to be promoting it on uh, social media. So stay tuned for that. Watch next week. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in. All right, ending the video.